Well, it's my honor, my pleasure to be talking today with Taib Smith, and you are, I would say, a multi-hyphenate um, Philly native and just doing so many things in real estate and in media, and um, I'm sure you're going to share with us all the other things you're into, but we're here today to talk about uh, Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward tribute, which is a project that you have um ideated, have created, and uh, it's such an important opportunity to reimagine, revisit, um, reclaim mm -hmm. the history of Philadelphia, uh, the Black history of Philadelphia. So one, thank you, because I know you're super busy, um, for making the time to have this conversation. And we're super excited at Word to be a partner, a media partner with this important work. So so tell us, let's get started with just the basics. What is Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward tribute, and why did you create it now? Mm. So first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you also always for being uh, a welcoming platform to talk about, you know, issues that are important to the Black community. Um, but Legacy Reclaimed I would say it's something that has been co-created and I was one of the um, Germanic seeds in the, in the creation. So um, over the course of a couple of years, um, a couple of books had come to me and the seventh ward was always referenced or mentioned. And um, this also relates to some of my other work in recent years, like the Dream Deferred Project, which was an exploration of uh, redlining through the lens of Philadelphia. And that project was the past, present, and future of Philadelphia. So through reading um, things like Marcus Hunter's um, Black City Makers, um, a book called Up South, um, I think we've talked about it before, uh, the um, the book about Octavius Cato, Tasting Freedom. Um, while reading these books, I had met my wife when we were dating. She lived in Queens Village, and I lived in Fittler Square. Um, and many people don't realize that the Seventh Ward extends historically all the way up to the Schuylkill. So, we so I would like at some point for you to give us the geographic boundaries of the Seventh Ward, but keep going. Um, yes. So through the, these walks, like my mind would connect to the blue, little blue signs that would delineate the, like these historical markers. But then also I would see things like Tinley Temple, Mother Bethel, um, certain street names. And it just resonated with me that it didn't tell the depth and the breadth of the history that was so unique, um, not just to Philadelphia, but to I would say the black diaspora and uh, the Western Hemisphere. So like first black benevolent organizations that came through churches, came through, you know, entrepreneurs who were caterers and barbers who actually serviced the white community who were investing their own dollars collaboratively for the best interests of black people across an economic strata. So you think contemporary, that's really inspiring. And then walking along that, I know that my neighbors, some of my political representatives, some of the people who are urban planners were just disconnected to that reality. So, you know, having that, the privilege of that information also gave me a tremendous amount of trep trepidation. Because if you walk Society Hill, Queens Village, Fittler Square, Graduate Hospital, Rittenhouse. Which, which seems like most of that used to just be called South Philly. Right, right. <laughs> now it's like, right, right. you know, Bella Vista. Right, right. Well, in the naming of spaces, there's an evolution that is usually in some way connected to um, the reimagining or the displacement of a people. So even when I was a child and I lived in the Friends Housing Co-op, not far from here, over at um, like 8th and 7th between Brown and Fairmount, um, People didn't call Northern Liberties, Northern Liberties, but Northern Liberties was a name from a hundred years ago that be, kind of was reborn and rebranded 
for a new identity of what a portion of North Philly was going to become. Mm. So to get back to the seventh ward, um, being a, you know a, a fan of history and also having the benefit of a, a urban, you know, oral history from my, my mother, my father, my aunts, you know, different community members, the curi- curiosity through books, and then also stories that I was always always told about black Philadelphians kind of gave me this, you know, awareness that I felt um, compelled to figure out a way to get more people talking, thinking, and reimagining how we can, you know, reclaim, reclaim that legacy. So so tell us the, the geographic boundaries of the Seventh Ward. So um, Sixth Street, well, I'm, I'm going to preface. I am not a historian. And I'm, I'm I just I'm play one on on word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm passionate about history, uh, Black history in particular. But um, one of our partners on this project is a woman named Amy Hillier, who's an academic at University of Pennsylvania. She's the official historian for the project. But um, I would say South Street, or as far as Bainbridge to Spruce, from Sixth Street to the Schuylkill River. Now, depending on your historian, other people might debate that. I, and I've also had conversations with Amy a, about this very subject because, you know, you can sometimes something will be in proximity to the official boundaries of the Seventh Ward, and someone will say, "Well, that wasn't in the Seventh Ward." And that from my perspective, a migrant moving to Philadelphia from the South, who was trying to find housing, you know, whether living in a rooming house or you know, in housing connected to a benevolent organization are, you know, just renting space, wouldn't have the contextualization of a Eurocentric perspective of a voting district. You know, people, marginalized people tend to proximity. Um, so, that, so you're saying that, that that area, the Seventh Ward, was predominantly black. At least two-thirds, I think. About two-thirds black, and that is basically what we would call like Society Hill and, Mm -hmm. you know, all the other places um, that you, you know, like Jefferson Hospital area, like is Fittler Square, like all of those things are kind of pieces, pieces pieces of them. But those are like now very gentrified, some of the most expensive real estate in the city. Not just gentrified. Yes, some of the most expensive real estate. But if for the people who live there, um, it's unimaginable to think that that was where um, the first hospital for black people above the Mason-Dixon line was at, was it like 15th and Lumbar, mm-hmm. right? Right next to, up on the same block where Wesleyan AME still sits. Um, yeah, so there's just a, a multitude of history, you know, that exists within that area that most people are not, not aware of. Bless, bless you. Um, so, so if, if, um, so tell us a little bit about what people can experience Mm -hmm. in this, you know, Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward Tribute initiative, because there's a walking tour, there's several components to it. Um, tell us about the actual, uh, programmatic elements and, and how people can get involved. Okay. So first way people can go get involved is go to the website, which is Seventh Ward Tribute. Dot com. Um, Saturdays at 11 a.m., there are walking tours that begin at Mother Bethel AME at 6th and Lumbar. And for those who don't know, Mother Bethel is the oldest and longest, most consistent black-owned piece of land in the United States. Mm. Right, so the church that sits there today is the third rendition of the church story. Um, two other buildings that sat on that lap. Mm. Also, um, Richard Allen, who's the founder of the AME, that's the first AME in the, in the world, and now the AME is all over. Um, his tomb is in the basement, where there's also a museum that people can, can visit. Um, in addition, we have a pop-up gallery at Rex and the Royal at, in the 1500 block of South Street, where there are pictures from the urban archives of images from the Seventh Ward. 
Um, and when but, is that open? How what, how do people, um, can you go anytime? Anytime that the restaurant okay. and, this, and cafe are, are open. Mm-hmm. Um, also on the first floor, one of the artists involved in the project, Lee Sumter, has her like futurist art exhibition there um, that I won't go into detail with because it's brilliant. It's expansive. People should definitely kind of check it out. Um, and in the gallery, the images that were curated by Beth Lewis and Amelia Carter, who are the other two artists involved in the project, are those you know images from the Philadelphia Archives and I uh, believe the um, Philadelphia Public Library collection. Those Im- some of the selections from those images are also placed throughout residents. Um, some storefronts and churches at different locations that are along the walking tour. And how long is this, um, these installations going to be? How long is the project? So our programming lasts through February. Um, I can't answer you how long they'll be up because we've gotten, um, let's say, a surprising amount of interest in, let's say, reimagining how there can be sustainable aspects to parts of the project. So uh, our project manager and um, one of the partners of the project, Brittany Norman Coleman, is uh, leading that and we're exploring. So let me just reintroduce you for our radio listeners. Uh, we were talking with Taib Smith, and he is a, a native Philadelphian. He's a real estate um, person, a media person. He's talking with us today about Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward tribute, a project that he and several others have co-created to really talk about the the Black history of a very important part of Philadelphia that, um, you know, many people don't know. Many, I mean, and, and we know that there's currently an assault on Black history. Mm. We know that there is currently an effort to erase um, our our history, our reality, all of it. And so I want to see if you could talk a little bit about kind of um, this work within the context of that uh, effort of erasure and the reality that we just installed or, or uh, elected our first female mayor, our first black woman mayor, you know, City Council president is African American. You know the the City Council mm. is predominantly African American, mm. and Philly is a very black city. Mm. But yet, it's also incredibly segregated and economically bifurcated um, a- along racial lines. And I just think that you know there's so much that we can learn from our history, but so many of us don't know it. But we're also living in an in a present time where there's a lot of, I think, momentum around black power, mm. in a sense. But it is it's still disconnected from that history of intellect and um, you know entrepreneurship and all the things that was very much a part of the black experience back in the 1800s and and the seventh ward was a was kind of a um a centerpiece of all of that i don't know i, I don't know you find no, the question no, in there no no i mean you you you, you said a mouthful that i think it definitely speaks to what inspires the project i mean i feel you know as someone who um is the great grandchild of sharecroppers who um had parents grew up in public housing public housing named after Richard Allen, right? Not far from where we are today. I feel incredibly privileged to be an entrepreneur in the city of Philadelphia and be a, someone who started, you know, several businesses, um, who's been involved in, you know, numerous impactful projects. But I feel privileged because I'm endowed with a certain black gaze of the American experiment. And I, I, you know, I empathize deeply with children who are unknowingly are indoctrinated with um, a narrative about themselves and American history and colonialism and imperialism that does not serve them. 
so you know you have to almost radically shake off the indoctrination of white supremacy if you have uh, you know just a uh, linear and traditional education um so you know i don't know where the question is but i think you sp spoke eloquently to what inspires not just this project but a, a lot of my work um and for you know i've had so many different experiences whether it's talking to people who work with in public policy who are ignorant of you know just facts like if you live in strawberry mansion versus living in society hill you potentially have 20 years less in your lifespan all right like and there's all kinds of ways to delineate the social determinants of health but we live in a construct of white supremacy that is stealing time from us all right so one of my I'll be bold and say superpowers is that I know what our per people's journey has been. Also, I would say that um, black in innovation is also often hidden through um, white laws. And, you know, the innovation that came from the benevolent organizations that, you know, started and Philadelphia, you know, and evolved into other black spaces around the country. Um, that it's our job to keep those stories alive. I, I think there's a um, African American colloquialism that says the last you you actually die is the last time someone speaks your name. Mm. Right, so it's important that every generation knows the names of people like William Still. You know, Octavius Cato, W. D. Du Bois, Marian Anderson. Um And these are all people who inhabited or, or studied and worked in the seventh ward. Or yes. in Philadelphia. Or in Philadelphia. But like even like didn't W. B. Du Bois, the, the Philadelphia Negro, mm -hmm. a lot of his work was centered in that. Absolutely. Area. So the Philadelphia Du Bois was um com I don't know if the right term was. He was commissioned to come to Philadelphia to do a paper to study the black problem, right? And that, can't, that actually came out of- What does it feel like to be a problem? Right. <laughs> um, so uh, what drew him to, to the city was, um, let's say a paternal white uh, philanthropic infrastructure that wanted to, an answer to the black problem. And I think one of his radical acts was to, which was extremely hard, if you imagine, at the beginning of the 20th century, was to actually do um, an analysis of the structure of white supremacy that was creating the problem. Mm -hmm. right? And that was actually, um, I believe, the first anthropological study of an urban environment. And Du Bois oftentimes doesn't get credit for that. So mm -hmm. people think of it as just him studying um, also his, his sensibility of mapping and his style of surveying, um, was also an innovative, um, format that came out of that endeavor. So what do you want people to, um, not just take from this project, but like, um, ingest, like mm. digest and, um, how can it be used to change and transform? Mm -hmm. So another element of the project that I did, didn't get to mention as one of our partners, um, Mural Arts, um, is going to receive our curriculum that Amy Hillier has helped us develop. And um, it's my hope and wish that that curriculum becomes evergreen within summer programs or in partnership with, with elementary schools, high school, colleges, um, so that more people are exploring uh, this history and kind of keeping it alive. I also think um, as a city and a region, even as a state, we're not being thoughtful, nor are we, um, I hate to say taking advantage, but uh, um, sometimes to get things done, you have to make people see where the benefit is. But from a tourism and hospitality perspective, if you look at our infrastructure, we don't tell our unique 
story. I, there's far too much, you know, I, I'll be frank, there's too, there's too much Ben Franklin, there's too much of an always sunny in Philadelphia, you know, like a, a, a very um, Eurocentric perspective on Philadelphia identity, even to the fact that like Rocky Balboa is a fictitious narrative of, I believe I learned from um, Joe Frazier's daughter that the Rocky story is actually the story of three or four African-American fighters combined. Mm. And I, so, um, and you, you know, within three to five hours of Philadelphia, um, I think there's more African-American people than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere. All right, so like in our, in our identity of, of our city, um, there's, you know, we have a very narrow scope of how we talk about American history. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and one of the things, because, you know, as you know, I'm I'm um, spending a lot of time outside of Philly right now. And the thing that really resonates with me when I come back to Philly is just how black of a city Philly is. And there are not a lot of major cities anymore that have like a strong black aesthetic, a strong black population. I mean, like, like you, you go to Brooklyn, which used to be like very, mm-hmm. you don't see black people. Mm-hmm. It's like, like maybe in pockets, but so like, I think that to your point, this reimagining of and embracing kind of our black history, our black culture in a city like Philadelphia is, is, is really powerful and important because a lot of the places where black people have historically been, we are not anymore in, mm-hmm. in other parts of the the country. Um, and so I want to ask you, and this will probably be one of my my last questions. Um, you know, we're we're coming up on um a major election, you know, presidential election, 2024. Um, it is a lot of people are seeing it as a um you know, a real fight for democracy, a real like question, like a, an exist. There's an existential threat to the future of America and what that means for for black people when you have a potential like fascist as a um, as a presidential nominee um, who was the president before, whatever. Um, so my question is and again, this is going to be like a, a a conglomeration of things. I'm just like throwing it all together because we're also coming off of Claudine Gay, the former president of Harvard, being ousted or you know forced to resign behind these you know um, bogus claims, mm-hmm. which come down to we don't think a black person is qualified to head up one of these you know elite institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a, a full on assault on black people right now, wh- whether it's quiet or not. Um, but there really is. And that's going to, I think, come to a head during this presidential cycle. Mm-hmm. And so my question to you is, as somebody who is really a, a student of history, um, uh, you know, a, an activist, an intellectual what is the counterattack? What is, how do we as black people who have always been standing in the gap, have always been the ones who have like made this country what it is and live up to its, you know, its ideals. Like what can we do now mm. Mm. when there is all of this, you know, like very serious this this very serious assault on democracy, the things that that are um, essential to, I think, our our existence. Mm. She, Sarah, you said a lot, and uh, oof. I, well, one, there has never been a time as of yet when there hasn't been an assault on black identity, black life, uh, black intellectualism, black history. And when you believe that there is not, you are usually asleep at the wheel, um, being propagandized or against or naive. Um, something said reminded me of um, some of Ida B. Wells' writing and how she describes 
that and the, the waves of lynching, particularly in the Red Summer of 1919, it was black people who had printing presses or black people who were actually, you know, of that culture of benevolent, investing in benevolent organizations in the best interest of their own people who were assaulted. Um, but the propaganda was that it was because some black man had ran off with some white woman in the night. Um, so I, I use that as a, as a framework that with every generation, there is a propaganda war that is more about taking away people's freedoms or exploiting their labor or, you know, dumbing down the, you know, the body politic. Um, and when we are in denial of that is when we are most in danger. So, uh, historically through, um, organizing through fellowship, um, and I, I think a type of organizing, to, to, to be frank, can exist on platforms that we don't control. You know, everything is not for Instagram. Everything is not in a, in a Facebook group. And sometimes people have to find ways to strategically um, move. And if you look within um, history, and not just African-American history, but if you look within organizing movements, you know, nationally and around the world, you know, people who organize are usually the ones who blast. Um, and then I would also say we have to stay away from concepts of charismatic leadership that have one singular identity as a leader versus a, a movement or a group of people. But, you know, mostly the thing that's helped me stay intellectually free is literacy, research, curiosity, you know, mentorship. So, okay, this is really going to be my last question. We're talking with Taib Smith about his uh, brilliant project called Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward tribute. We're talking about a lot of other things, too. <laughs> um, but well, I, can't, um, I can't have you here and um, be having this conversation without expressing how excited I am about the project that we are partner partnering on um, in Mantua with the new... Um, Word, you know, headquarters, and we're going to be collaborating on a cafe, bookstore, the reading room to bring that um, intellectual curiosity and rigor and all of those things to a space that we will be, you know, sharing and co curating and um, just creating, I think, a hub for Black intellectualism, black progressive thought, black, um, blackness. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I just want to see if you want to say anything about your part of that, that effort. Um, I, I look forward to bringing it to fruition, you know, yes. um, uh, um, shout out to Charles Lomax. Uh, yes. you know, I want, I want to get, I want to get started. I think it will be, uh, another beautiful endeavor. Um, and, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate to work with the Lomax team. I can remember when I first learned about you and your family, even before, I think it was Julian Duggan mm. who first brought us all together. Mm. And I rem remember, um, you know, for a short period, having the benefit of mentorship from your father. Um, and I also have to mention uh, my dad's deep, love and appreciation for, for the station and the Lomax family. And it is reciprocal, yeah. our deep appreciation for your dad as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a brilliant project that is long overdue. Uh, and I think, um, you know, spaces like Harriet's, spaces like Uncle Bobby's, spaces like um, Crimson Moon. Oh, I remember Crimson Moon. You know, for... <laughs> I, Fabulous. I, for those who were able to participate or visit or be a part of what Crimson Moon was or represented to a certain time in Philadelphia, um, sometimes you don't know what you're losing when it first goes away. And that's a space that I think definitely had um, a huge impact on just our perspective on possibility 
you know, from black aesthetics to a welcoming space in, in Center City at that time. Um, we didn't know what we had until it was gone. And that's often the case. So before I let you go, just um, the specifics about how people learn more about Legacy Reclaimed, a Seventh Ward tribute. So SeventhWardTribute.com, uh, uh, Seventh Ward Tribute on Instagram. Is that pay? Yeah, yeah. You, you Google it. You can find it. <laughs> um, and then also um, Mother Bethel. We have tours at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, going up until I think mid February. Um, Is there a cost? No, everything's free. Yeah, right. Just got you. Yeah. Oh, right. shout out to Pew Charitable Trust, Pew Heritage. Got to, got to, got to, got to thank your your funders. Yeah. Um. Also, I would say, you know, Black history is our responsibility, All right? and even if you look at the archives and the collections of um, even hip hop. It's not in our hands. It's in the same academic in institutions, archives that, you know, frankly benefited from, from the slave economy. Um, so we have to do a better job of controlling our African-American heritage and keeping um, our ancestors is energy alive. Absolutely. I think that's a wonderful way, place to uh, to end. Thank you so much, Taib Smith. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to check out Legacy Reclaimed, a seventh board tribute. Appreciate you. Thank you.